Thank you. I'm very excited with my colleagues to be here and present new developments in atopic dermatitis. Very exciting times. And I was tasked to present you pathogenesis in 15 minutes, an almost impossible task, so hopefully we'll make it. <laughs> my disclosures, I do work with multiple companies on the development of new drugs for atopic dermatitis. I'm actually quite proud of being part of this therapeutic development that is ongoing now for AD. So atopic dermatitis, for those of you that do not know, it's actually the most common inflammatory skin disease in both adults and children. Three to seven percent of the adults in the United States, and in Asia it's more, up to 10 percent, and up to 25 percent of the children worldwide. Very similar to psoriasis, a third of our patients with AD have moderate to severe disease, and there is a really large unmet need for safer and effective treatments, both topicals and systemics, in adults and children. Now, as Donald Leung and I put forward in a recent review, atopic dermatitis is quite a complex disease. You may say it's more complex than psoriasis, and it is characterized by abnormalities in both barrier and immune responses. And that led to some confusion because pharma companies did not know what they should go after. Should they go after the barrier abnormalities or should they go after immune responses? Now, when I started my road, I like to say, in atopic dermatitis, I started in the lab of Jim Kruger that you heard this lecture a few days ago on psoriasis. It was just natural for me to start by comparing these two diseases. And here I put a chronic a phase of atopic dermatitis, as you see. And if I would hide what is atopic dermatitis and what is psoriasis, I'm sure most of us will not be able to recognize. Both are characterized by hyperplasia. And when you stain for proliferation markers, keratin-16 and Ki-67, two very good proliferation markers, you get the same picture of very wide expression of these markers and very similar hyperplasia in both patients. Next, we went to see if immune infiltrates, T cells and dendritic cells, differ in these diseases, and frankly, they do not. Both diseases have very wide expression of T cells, but also dendritic cells in skin lesions, in the epidermis and the dermis. Now, very similar to psoriasis in atopic dermatitis, the these T cells are producing inflammatory molecules, cytokines, only they have different flavors than psoriasis. In psoriasis, it's Th17 centered. In atopic dermatitis, it's Th2 and Th22 centered with expression of molecules like IL-13, one of the main cytokines of the Th2 pathway, and chemokines such as CCL11, 17, 18, and the main cytokine of the Th22 pathway, IL-22, and the S100s. Now, one important difference than psoriasis, and it's very relevant for our patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, the non-lesional skin, the seemingly normal skin of patients with atopic dermatitis is not at all normal. In psoriasis, it's actually closer to normal. But in atopic dermatitis, it's abnormal. It already has expression of these cytokines and chemokines. So you may not give just topical treatments to patients with moderate to severe disease because their non-lesional skin is already abnormal. Now, quite a few years ago, I would say about seven years ago, I asked the question, can the psoriasis model that at that time was already so successful with many treatments being brought forward at that time, this bedside to bench pathogenic dissection and translational testing of therapeutics could also be applied to atopic dermatitis. And that was not a, the case at the time, but I want to convince you that the answer to that is a definite <laughs> yes. <laughs> However, I think there is a road to pass, and there are few requirements for the same translational approach in atopic dermatitis that were not met at the time seven years ago, but definitely I think they are met today. So what are these requirements? We need a well-defined molecular disease phenotype, exactly like we have in psoriasis, as Jim put forward. And we need a very good understanding of inflammatory circuits that characterize atopic dermatitis. That was not available when I started. We also need very good biomarkers to mark disease activity at baseline. But even more important, we need good biomarkers of a response. Because in atopic dermatitis, for those of you that do not know, we have very high placebo responses. In psoriasis, placebo responses are 3%. In atopic dermatitis, we are talking about 23% and 25%, because the lesions are blending with the surrounding. 
really very hard to tell the difference, so we have to have these biomarkers. So another thing that is really important, we need to have access to drugs that will be selective and selectively target the immune system. That, again, was not available when I started. And this is one of the most important slides, I think, of today's lecture, because um, this lays out uh, the immune pathways of the disease and how you go after them with different treatments that are being developed now. So what do you have here? You have already elevation of cytokines, of inflammatory molecules, already at the non-lesional stage. And this process goes forward to acute disease and amplifies in chronic disease. So what are these cytokines? And what are their effects on the epidermis? So we have the Th2 cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, that inhibit antimicrobial peptides. Antimicrobial peptides are really important to fight infections, and we all know the association of atopic dermatitis with staph infections. The same Th2 cytokines also disrupt barrier proteins, filagrin, loricrin, involucrin, and also reduce lipids. We also have IL-31, the each cytokine that starts an each scratch-like unification cycle that is also very relevant to atopic dermatitis. Then we have IL-22 that derives from Th22 cells, and IL-22 is really important for the onset of hyperplasia in atopic dermatitis, and also is able to disrupt the barrier with reduction of the same filagrin, loricrin, and other barrier molecules. And importantly, it also synergizes with Th17 that is important in psoriasis to increase the S100s. And this process carries forward to chronic disease and, again, is extremely relevant to treatments that you'll hear about in the next few years. Now, we have to ask, because all of us treat a lot of children with atopic dermatitis. That's actually a very large part of the population of patients. So we have to ask, is the pediatric patients or pediatric AD phenotype, are they similar to adults or is it a different phenotype? Now, we need to remember that the paradigm-shifting discoveries on atopic dermatitis that I highlighted here were all based on adults. They were not based on children. They were based on adults that have many years of chronic disease. And 85% of our cases start before the age of five. So I was very lucky to be able to collaborate with a wonderful lady, Amy Paller, that is not here today. And together with her, we wanted to determine what is the phenotype of really early onset atopic dermatitis in children. And when I say early onset, we mean within six months of disease initiation. So we assessed skin and blood samples. I'll only show you here the skin results from 20 atopic dermatitis children, all less than five years old and all within six months of disease onset. The majority was actually less than three years old, as well as 14 age match controls. You can imagine how hard it is to assemble skin and blood from these children. We were quite surprised to see the results of this study because these children are within six months of disease initiation and if you look at their skin phenotype, and here we stand for several proliferation markers, keratin-16, K67, and S100, and here is an H and E, you can see very similar hyperplasia in the lesions of children, similar to the adult lesion, and frankly, also quite similar to psoriasis. But the surprise was actually even more in the non-lesional skin because the children had higher hyperplasia in their non-lesional skin, and also, if you stain for proliferation markers, they are more highly stained in children. And if you look at the entire group, and here are the children, healthy, non-lesional children, lesional children, and the same for adults, and here is psoriasis in blue. So when you look at the uh, statistics of the entire group, you can see very similar epidermal thickness in children and adults, but when you look at the proliferation marker, keratin-16, in non-lesional skin of children, much more increased compared to the non-lesional of adults, and the same actually in the lesional skin. So really profound hyperplasia very early on in children. What happens with inflammatory markers, the Th2 cytokines, are already increased in children in lesional skin, and Again, the non-lesional skin is even more diseased with higher expression of Th2 markers, and I want to highlight IL-31, the EAT cytokine, 
highly increased already at the non-lesional skin of children, much more than in adults, but that also holds true for IL-5, another TH2 cytokine, again, highly increased compared to adults in non-lesional skin, and IL-13 also shows higher increase in children. Now, what happened with filagrin? Filagrin, we heard a lot about filagrin and the barrier. It's really down-regulated in adults, as we know, in both lesions and non-lesional skin. In children, we don't have that down-regulation. And when you stain for filagrin, it shows a very nice expression in the epidermis. So there is not a deficiency in filagrin in children. So to conclude on children, there is early and potent TH2 activation in children. The pediatric non-lesional skin is already abnormal very early on with significant inflammation, so that maybe reflects true initiation of atopic dermatitis. And the filagrin deficiency of adult atopic dermatitis is missing in early atopic dermatitis, and I think that really challenges the notion of filagrin as being central for disease elicitation and instigator of the atopic march. And I think these data also are very highly relevant for the prevention of the entire atopic march. And why is that? We need to remember eczema is the window for the atopic march. It's what starts first being followed by food allergy, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. So future studies should determine whether once the disease already developed, is it possible to prevent the atopic march by appropriate immune manipulations, either broad targeting or specific T cell targeting. That remains to be determined. Now, how do we test the immune hypothesis of atopic dermatitis? A prediction of the immune model is that immune suppression is able to reverse the epidermal phenotype. We will reject this hypothesis if immune suppression is achieved, but the epidermal phenotype is persisting. And I want to show you, due to lack of time, just one test of this hypothesis. Our study with dupilumab, you'll hear much more about dupilumab, that is a specific TH2 antagonist. So I'll not get very much into the mechanism of dupilumab, but it's a fully a, a monoclonal antibody targeting a IL-4 receptor alpha, and because it targets the receptor, it potently inhibits both IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. This was just a proof of concept study, only four weeks, 67 patients, weekly injections of 75, 150, 300 milligram, and placebo. And 18 out of these patients luckily also participated in a biopsy sub-study. Now, these are the, re the easy 50 results of the study. This has been published, and I'll not uh, go into it, but already at week two, it was clear that there is something here, and we see very nice dose responses at week four. And importantly for you, there were no differences in responses between atopic dermatitis patients based on levels of IgE or based on filagrin mutation status. Everybody reacted the same to the drug. This is our molecular findings uh, that we did for uh, the study in our 18 patients. Again, keratin-16, very good markers of turning off the proliferation, the hyperplasia. There is a nice dose response with high reduction in the 300 milligram and increases in placebo. And when you look at many molecular markers that belong to multiple pathways, you see major suppression with dupilumab 300 with the highest dose, whereas in placebo, there are upregulation of these markers. From a larger study, a phase two study that we just concluded, there is also reduction in hyperplasia with dupilumab. And this is a 16-week study. You see really a turning off of hyperplasia at week 16. This is the thickness measurement. And here we have keratin-16. It's really turned off with dupilumab at week 16. Filagrin that you see here shows skipped expression at week 0, shows very nice expression at week 16. So really, it changes also the barrier defects. And epidermal thickness was reduced by 40%. So dupilumab really impacted both the inflammation and the barrier defect of atopic dermatitis. I think establishing IL-4 and IL-13 as pathogenic cytokines, but also cementing atopic dermatitis is very important as reversibly. And immune-driven like psoriasis. This is the first proof. Some pictures of my own patients in studies. 
And very briefly, I want to end with a, what features of atopic dermatitis may be explained by other cytokine pathways, such as IL-22, because TH2 may not be the entire story of atopic dermatitis. Again, IL-22 is important for hyperplasia, also impairs the terminal differentiation of atopic dermatitis, and we hypothesize that IL-22 treatment may be effective in patients with chronic disease, we finalized the study in 60 patients, and I'm happy to tell you that the results are positive. We will present it at the SID this year. And just to show you one patient with very lichenified lesions, turned off, and this is three months post-treatment. So I think we'll have some more excitement uh, down the road with other pathways. The investigational targets are filling up, and you'll hear much more from others about this. So to sum it up, Atopic dermatitis is not as simple as psoriasis. It's not just one cytokine pathway like psoriasis T17. And, but the consistent cytokine axis activated across adults and children appears to be TH2. But this doesn't exclude that other cytokine targeting may not be also effective in atopic dermatitis. And we need clinical trials targeting all these immune axes together with mechanism so that we'll understand the relative contribution of each one of these axes to the atopic dermatitis phenotype. But I think you'll agree that we are beginning a really exciting path for new treatment paradigm for atopic dermatitis, which you'll hear much more from my colleagues later. Thank you so much.